The resurrection of Jesus, as far as all the Christian churches are concerned, is absolutely fundamental to the faith. Um, there's no question, in my mind, that it's ever going to be changed. The resurrection may be fundamental to the faith, but in our examination of what really happened, it's hard to find solid historical evidence. The four Gospels all tell different stories. When we read the resurrection narratives, uh, it's like reading four different reports of the same football game in four rather different newspapers. And uh, the fact that actually there may be some disagreement about whether it was a foul or not doesn't mean that there wasn't a game and that somebody didn't win it and so on. If one of them says there were two angels and another one says there was one angel, if one of them says Mary Magdalene was there all by herself and somebody else says Mary Magdalene was there with one or two other women, um, then these are the sorts of variations that you expect to get, like the different newspaper reports of the football match. Um, and they're not something that should worry you to the point of saying, therefore nothing happened. That would be quite a false conclusion. But in the earliest versions of the earliest gospel, Mark, there are no resurrection appearances at all. The gospel simply ends with the discovery of an empty tomb. The last verses of Mark, which do contain resurrection stories, were added 200 years later. None of the gospel stories is CNN in Jerusalem in the year 30. The Gospels are written in the form of historical biography, so many people have assumed that they are exactly that. But they're, that's not actually what they are. They're written to demonstrate to people the importance and the meaning of Jesus and his teaching. That was what they're for, and they do that very well. But they're not primarily interested in what actually happened back there. Matthew and Luke do have resurrection appearances, but they don't agree about the details. In Matthew, Jesus meets the women near the tomb and then meets his disciples just one time, and that is on a mountain in Galilee. In Luke, Jesus meets two unnamed disciples who do not recognize him, and then with the 11 remaining disciples before leaving them in a village outside Jerusalem. The last gospel, John, has many different resurrection stories. For many modern scholars, these variations suggest that the stories were not written to tell of a miraculous event, but with an entirely different and political motive. For it was the supposed witnesses of the resurrection who became the leaders of the early church. Even to this day, the Pope claims his authority in a direct, unbroken line of ordination from Peter, the first disciple said to have seen the risen Christ. Some scholars go so far as to suggest that the story of the resurrection was also created as an extraordinary psychological tool to bring in new converts. If it hadn't been for the resurrection of Jesus and his rising from the dead, victorious from the dead, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas. It's a bit like when you go into the army, the first thing we want is to take over your body. So symbolically, let's say we're going to shave all your hair. As long as you give in on this, we got you. We got your body, which is what we want. In one sense, sometimes the churches, some churches at least, do the same. We're going to tell you something unbelievable that you got to believe. When they could just relax. If you believe it, then you will believe that they alone control heaven, that without them you cannot get into heaven, and then they've got you. You've left your brains in the parking lot. That's a statement that may be offensive to many Christians. It would certainly be offensive to the worshippers at the Toronto Airport Church, who take their belief in the literal truth of the resurrection of Jesus very seriously indeed. For these Christians, the risen Christ is an active part of the church, and they believe that in 1994, Jesus blessed their church with a miraculous healing mission. For one minute, bambre bodos paraderira vaca day in the spirit for one minute. Since then, thousands of churches around the world have claimed to be touched by what became known as the Toronto Blessing. Glorious coming into the room. Hey, glorious. 
and in Toronto, in a splendid new church built by contributions from the faithful, the congregation continue to celebrate their belief in the resurrected Christ. Well, be blessed. Here, on an almost weekly basis, they claim that their faith has the power to miraculously heal. So God's going to heal you right now? There it goes, and the neck is healed in Jesus' name. Don't you like it? I like it! Bless you, brother. Today, it seems to me that there are many people who will strongly defend the literal truth of the resurrection. Many others who are Christians or not Christians believe that perhaps, you know, those who die may be alive in some way, that Jesus who died might be in some sense alive, whatever one means by that. And there are many others who take it as, a, as an image of hope, because after all, the, talking about the resurrection of Jesus has a great deal to do with what we think about life after death, or for that matter, our own prospects. The problem for the church in the 21st century, in a technological and secular age, is that some people find it hard to believe in the literal truth of the miracles, let alone the miracle of the resurrection. Since the 18th century, we, we, we've lived in a climate where people have distinguished between faith and belief. So the, the whole effect of science on religion, really, has been to throw religion back to prove what we can believe in. But week in and week out, congregations gather in Christian churches and recite together an ancient creed from the Latin word credo, meaning I believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. At the climax of the creed, all Christians affirm their belief in the resurrection. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his but whatever is said in church, many Christian theologians no longer consider the resurrection to be an historical fact. And this has not just been a problem of the 21st century. A thousand years ago, a group of devout Christians in southern France also held unorthodox, heretical views. In the 11th and 12th centuries, the Cathars, a deeply religious group, believed that all material things were the work of the devil. They saw Jesus as an angel, who certainly could not have been physically crucified and certainly would not have been resurrected as a physical body. It was actually in response to the Cathar heresy that the church created the Inquisition. In 1244, the last 200 of the Cathars were rounded up and burned at the stake as heretics. The church has always reacted strongly against anyone who doubted the truth of the resurrection, because that doubt insinuates that the very literal and physical gospel descriptions of the death and resurrection of Jesus are fabrications. But there is one story, also set in France, at about the same time as the Cathars, which suggests that another Christian group made a discovery which really might reveal that the resurrection story was not true. In the 13th century, this whole area was a stronghold of the Knights Templar, a strict religious and military order of warrior monks. Local historian Thierry Lecon has spent the last 12 years uncovering the history of the Knights Templar in this region. The Templars came to this region. There are traces of them all over the countryside. Down there at the bottom, near Chateau de Blanchefond, there are ruins of an old Templar command post. The Knights Templar were committed to poverty, chastity, and the protection of pilgrims en route to the Holy Land. But their main purpose was to keep Jerusalem and the holy sites of Christianity free from the forces of Islam. During the years they were in the Holy Land, the Templars built their own castles. But they buried their dead in graveyards they excavated near to the original Temple of Solomon. And certainly, during this time, they were thought to have discovered great treasures.